bagging tins, kinda hard to get a job back out on the block. Charge that to the game. Young girl, she grew up in a rush, had it bad, no doubt she don't know who to trust. Every man she ever loved only wanna crush. Charge that to the game. But it's all Good afternoon. Welcome to Expose Under the Sun. Brought to you by the Detroit Native Sun newspaper. I am your guest host, Darwin Griffin. I'm filling in for Sharon Dumas. And I'm very, very honored to have our special guest on the show today. And he is an Emmy Award winning filmmaker. And his name is Bruce Harper. Mr. Harper, Hello. welcome to Expose Under the Sun. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. But I'd like to ask you real quick, just, just kind of tell our viewers a little bit about who Bruce Harper is. Oh, uh, well, Bruce Harper uh, is uh, a person who uh, started at the first black owned and operated television station in the, in the whole country, mm -hmm. WGPR. Okay. From there, I uh, left and worked at the NBC affiliate in town. And I stayed there for about 30 years or so, a little more than 30 years. And while I was there, I started a production company, Big City Films. And Big City Films is a company that does uh, scripts and documentaries and commercials and all those kind of things. And now that I've left the NBC affiliate, I'm doing Big City Films full time. And along the journey, we've done a lot of things. And one of the things what we did was we won a couple of Emmy Awards. Uh, so... That's Big City Films. That's Bruce Harper in a nutshell. Okay. Now, our show is live, so if you have questions for my guest, our call in numbers are area code 313 813-868-0342, 313-868-0351, 313-868-4336. And I know Mr. Harper would welcome any questions or any comments that you'd like to make. But, Bruce, now, tell, tell our audience a little bit about what you've been doing lately. Well, uh, <clears throat> lately I've been uh, screening a documentary that I made uh, uh, in 2017 called Summer 67. Summer 67 is the documentary about the 43 people that lost, lost their lives during the rebellion. And so over the last three years or so, I've been raising money, producing, and now airing and screening the documentary Summer 67. So that's what I've been doing uh, lately. And now I'm actually looking for money for another documentary that I'm, that I'm uh, looking to put together uh, sometime early next year. Okay, well, let's, let's go back to what you were saying. So the Summer 67. Mm -hmm. What was the Summer 67? What happened during that time? I heard you use the term rebellion because I know some people consider it to be a riot. What would you consider it to be? You, are you just saying it was a rebellion versus a riot? Because that's what a lot of people know it to be as the riot of 67 or the 67 riots. But what would you term it? Um, I, think, uh, <clears throat> I think the whole debate about a rebellion or a riot is an is a, a, a empty debate. I think that... Uh, Depending on where you are and where you, where you, how you view things, it was a rebellion in the sense that the Detroit Police Department had a long history of abuse of the African American community, and '67 was the uh, that the July '67 was a flashpoint, but there was a long history of things that date all the way back to the Civil War of issues with African Americans and the Detroit Police Department. So from that viewpoint, it's a rebellion. It's a riot from the viewpoint that uh, people were opportunistic and things happened uh, and people just took advantage of it. But the whole argument, argument about if it's a riot or rebellion, to me, is just kind of a non it's an empty argument. It's, it's like when I was at uh, the NBC affiliate and, and there was a storm in, uh, that happened, hit a neighborhood or area. We would go on and on about if it was straight winds or tornadic winds. Were the winds straight winds or were they tornadic winds? And I, and I would always think, what difference does it make? 
if your house is gone, doesn't matter if the winds were straight or if they were if they were a tornado. It doesn't really the matter. Wind was a wind. It was, <laughs> your house is gone. Right. A wind's a wind. So I think I think the rebellion, although quite not quite the same thing. I think the rebellion right is a similar argument. Is is it and to the point it can distract from the larger issues. Yeah, it probably was a rebellion, but the debate kind of distracts from the larger issue. Now, when you say the larger issue what was the larger issue in your opinion well the larger issue is uh systematic racism uh the larger issue is a climate that allowed 43 or so maybe 44 more than 45 people to lose their lives uh the larger issue is uh uh police brutality and the uh, victimization of a group of people. So those are the large issues, and those are the that uh, that's part of the climate that existed to allow those things to happen. So your your documentary, the summer '67. Yes. Tell a little bit about somebody what just that. Somebody just came in. <laughs> <laughs> tell tell more about what that entails what that documentary is about well the 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 summer 67 documentary itself is um it's the travels of sarah hewlett as she goes to try to find information uh about those 43 people now she's a reporter correct she's a reporter yes and uh it is uh and so we talk to different family members about who that person was in their family that that they lost and we look at news articles and we go to the neighborhoods where these people live. So it is the it is the journey to find out as much as we can about some of those 43 people. Because I know sometimes when you see just like what happened recently with the 17 persons that were killed in Florida when, yeah. when the gentleman went into the school. But you're trying to put a person as opposed to being a victim. And you want to give that person a name, yeah. not a statistic, saying person number yeah. seven or person number, whatever the case may be, up to those 43 individuals. So each one of those individuals was a person. And you want to go into the personality and the type of person that that was. That's exactly right. I mean, that, I mean you hit it there. Uh, uh, you, hit, you hit the uh, nail on the head. Uh, uh, these people get reduced to a blurb, a headline, a statement. Mm -hmm. Looter came out of X store, shot. And their lives were much more valuable than that. Their lives were much more than that. And in some cases, the the blurb is not a correct representation of their life at all. Uh, uh, So it it was important to see people who they were for who they were you know there were people on their way to work that died there were people that were sitting in their mother's uh uh apartment that died there were people that were doing things um that had nothing to do with rebellion or riot or anything like that but they still lost their lives so there's uh uh, so i think there was a value in even say even though uh some people we just had no clue to how to get to and, and we couldn't get to and if we could we couldn't have, we couldn't have put them on because of time's sake but there there there's a value to kind of just re- reiterating or or just kind of restating the fact that these were mothers and daughters and fathers and you know they they were people now the 43 <clears throat> lives that were taken how many of those were african american 33. So 33 out of the 43, and those other 10, what type of... In, in uh, well, they were uh, two firemen, one police officer, um, one person who was trying to put a fire off out on his apartment building. So when you said the police officer, was that some type, was that friendly fire, as they call it, where the person was shot by another police <clears throat> officer, or do you know? Uh, he was shot by another police officer. Uh, I don't know how friendly the fire was, <laughs> but, but well, I know that's what they call it. Sometimes. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. that's exactly what they call it. Uh, yeah, he was he he, he got into struggle and a, a gun was discharged and and um and he and he died. His son lives in the suburbs of Detroit. He still lives he still lives out 
you know, there. Uh, his mother lived in Detroit for a long time after that. Uh, but yeah, um, the, he was the only police officer, uh, Jerry Olshevy. Um, I'm sorry, Jerome Olshevy. Okay. Um, but there were two other, there were police officers, Carl Smith and the other name escapes me. Uh, and, and, and so there were just kind of this wide range of people. There was a woman in town that was at a hot, at a motel called the Harlan House, which is actually where, uh, you know where the half office is on the boulevard and uh, the lodge? Right. Okay, so there was a hotel there. There was a motel there. She was standing in the window watching all the activity out out the door, out the window, and a stray bullet came in and, and killed her. Wow. So uh, there were a lot of different ways that uh, people lost their lives. So the three police officers, all of them two, were pretty. Or the, one police officer, two, two firemen. firemen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now the firemen were there, and they were just putting out fires or trying to go and do what? Just, yeah, just exactly right. Uh, one fireman was uh, off duty and came in. Okay. And he got uh, pinned down by fire and uh, lost his life. I don't know if a, uh, I don't know if it was a stray bullet or a uh, or a power line fell on him, but something like that. But he was supposed to be off that day. In fact, he was off that day. He came in to re he reported to work to help out. So yeah, those kind of stories. So so what other type of occupations did Miss Hewlett right? Sarah, yes. Okay, did she find of those forty three? <clears throat> innocent victims what other type of occupations besides the fire person the uh huh, person? what are the occupations that's a uh, i have to think about that uh well um let's see the first person that uh was actually actually the first person that was assaulted that didn't die and i mean he died several days later was a shop owner okay yeah george mazinski uh, one of the early people, uh, I don't know if she was a second, her name was Sharon George. She was an exotic dancer. Um, now, where, where was she? Was she like in her? She was in a car okay. with her husband. They had dropped off uh, a gentleman, uh, their friend, and they were coming up Woodward trying to get back home, and a stray bullet entered the car and, and killed her. She was in the car with her husband and her brother. I've sub they she actually uh, her relatives actually didn't make the documentary, but subsequent to the documentary airing, I ended up having a conversation with Sharon's sister. And so and she kind of filled me in because she's searching for uh, kind of trying to put that together because she didn't know her sister and, you know, like that. And so she's trying to put her arms around that whole kind of. What happened to my sister? What are, what are the circumstances? Those kind of things. So you had a variety of age groups then, I'm assuming. That yes. Probably. Yes. So what was the youngest person? Four. Four years of age? Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming that person was what? In with his or her parents? She was in her parents' home. Okay. On, U on Euclid. On Euclid. And the National Guard were, out, uh, were in, on the street. Uh, her cousin lit a cigarette. The National Guard thought that they were taken on fire, and uh, they shot into the apartment. And when they shot into the apartment, they killed four-year-old four year old Tanya Blanding. And they, actually, or they, they also injured some people in the apartment also, but Tanya lost her life. So you say... Explain it again. You say it was so. Here's here's the here's the story as I understand it from Tanya's sister. Okay. Tanya's sister says, well, first of all, Tanya, from Tanya's sister's viewpoint, uh, they were asleep and then they woke up and then there was just bullets flying and things, you know. So that's how she knows. But what happened as the story is pieced together a little bit more, that there were National Guardsmen on the street. In front or near the apartment. Okay. And uh, her cousin lit a cigarette. And they saw they saw the uh, they saw the flash of light, and they thought that that's what they were taking on fire. So they saw the fire, the flame mm -hmm. from the from cigarette. From light. lighting a cigarette, yeah. And they thought that that was mm -hmm. yeah. a bullet or some. <clears throat> they thought somebody was shooting at them, and they just. Uh, obviously overreacted now the the thing with this whole sniper incident 
uh, or not incident, but this whole kind of series of snipers and being shot at them, it turns out that there weren't that many snipers in that whole five-day period. What was happening more times than not was that um, National Guardsmen would be on other streets and they would fire, they would discharge their weapon and it would get heard on another street and those guardsmen would thought, thought that they were un taken on fire. They thought the sound that they were hearing was direct fire to them. And so where uh, <clears throat> there were these widespread, it's not, now I'm not saying that there weren't snipers, I'm saying that the, ins the reports of them were exaggerated because of, a lot of that was echoes. So, so of the, now were there any lawsuits that were brought forth against? No. no. No, in fact, I had a conversation with Tanya's, Tanya Blanding's sister. Okay. And she's like, you know, they just left us alone. They didn't, no, no grief counseling, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, they wrote a, they wrote a letter to the, uh, to the, she wrote a letter to the president and the president didn't, sent her back some trinkets. Uh, uh, so no lawsuits. So uh, did they talk to, because I know who was it, Kavanaugh was the mayor? Of yeah. Detroit during that time, yeah. so nothing from Kavanaugh's office or from no, no, I, I didn't or? specifically ask uh, Kim about that. She just talked about her frustration. Kim talks about her frustration as it relates to not having a lifeline. Okay, and her uh, and what appears that they were left adrift. Uh, and from her viewpoint, uh, she went to sleep and she woke up and, and hell had broken loose. And so this is not her fault that they started shooting at her. And why, where's the support? Where's the, and so Kim, and, and so she will actually go on and talk about how Every few years, uh, people will come to her door and want to talk to her and want to ask her questions about what happened. And Kim's viewpoint is like, people didn't care about that when we were going through it. So why are you trying to drag us up every so, yeah, every so few years? So. Again, our show is live. <laughs> so if you have some questions that you'd like to ask filmmaker Bruce Harper, you can call in at 313-868-0342. 313-868-0351 or 868-4336. This, this sounds like a really fascinating subject. Well, I hope it is. And, 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 <laughs> and, and, and your documentary, how, how, so if someone was interested, tell, tell, because I know it's supposed to be viewed at a couple of places. I think tomorrow is one of the places. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, actually, yes, tomorrow is one of the places. Um, so, the documentary was designed to be a two-fold project. Okay. It was designed to be a broadcast project. So the, out the, right around the 50th anniversary, actually we were about two days off, that the documentary aired on Channel 56 okay. at uh, 8 o'clock. Uh, but the documentary was also designed to be a community project where we go from – churches and commu and c community centers and halls and all these kind of places and theaters and 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 screen the documentary for an audience and let the doc and then let uh the audience uh let the themes that are brought up in the documentary uh dovetail into a discussion about race and racism and those kind of things that uh that are kind of uh, that are touched on in the documentary so what happened to facilitate that, we partnered, Big City Films partnered with uh, an organization called uh, the Michigan Roundtable. Okay. The Michigan, you've heard of the Michigan Roundtable? Okay, well, you know the kind of great work the Michigan Roundtable does. So the Michigan Roundtable actually facilitates this whole discussion of race. They help us, uh, well, they actually... Uh, they get us into schools, and so we have conversations in schools. They get us into community centers, and we have the documentary, and we have discussions about that. So, um, so to get back to your question, so the documentary is going to be seen uh, tomorrow uh, at an accounting firm, which the name escapes me right now. 
and I should know. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, and then on Friday, it's going to be a shown at the Frederick Douglass Academy. Okay. And so that those two doc, uh, and then what times are going to be shown? What do you think? Uh, both at noon. At noon. Okay. Yep. 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 And then um, so is this open to the general public? They can come and witness actually, this, those particular two are not, but eighty percent of them the public can come to. Okay. Eighty percent of them. In fact, uh, I keep the re- website updated uh, pretty well on where it's where it's showing. Uh, and uh, you know times and and the address and the phone numbers are on can you of look all into, those places. Can you look in our camera and give that exact website? Oh, okay. Uh, the website is uh, bigcityfilms.com. So if you go to bigcityfilms.com and then go down to the poster that says Summer '67 and select that, it will take you to the Summer '67 uh, uh, website. So bigcityfilms.com. So we keep I keep the I keep the school events. I keep this the general market uh, the general audit screenings. I keep all of those things updated on the website. So now, if somebody wanted to get a copy of the video. Yes. How would they go about doing that? Through the website, or is that? Uh, well, in the strictest sense, there are no copies of the video okay. available. There, uh, there are only promotion a cop. Oh, there are only promotion copies available. Okay. So, are there any other? So, so those individuals that go to, like you said, the Frederick Douglass, yes, Academy, or that they go to the other venue tomorrow, yes, they can get a chance to see it. Yes, they will see. Yes, so to, to, to flush this out even further. So here's the thing: the documentary is about. Well, it's not about. It's 58 minutes long. So okay. I would say 60 minutes long. But when we air it in, when we screen it in schools, we screen a 36 minute version of the documentary. Okay. So those two venues, the the business and the school, this week will have the 36 minute version of the documentary to be screened because uh, obviously you know school we, we, we obviously we fit it for to fit in a classroom setting because we do want to have the whole conversation about uh, the themes of the documentary uh, to actually to be encompassed in that hour of a classroom uh, situ- situation so what what happens is uh, you think that uh, young people would not have the interest or not quickly uh, make the connection between the events that happened 50 years ago and what's going on right now, but they really, uh, they're really keen on, and they make that connection. They make the Trayvon Martin connection. They right. make all those connections of police brutality and how things are then and now. And so it ends up being a lively discussion. So if someone was interested and they wanted to find out more about Big City Productions, give your contact information again in a few minutes that we have left. Big City Films. Uh, and you go to the website bigcityfilms.com, and the contact information is there. My our, our office number is there. My uh, my uh, email address is there. So if you want any of those, any of that kind of information, bigcityfilms.com. And so now, just just if you could take one minute or so, just to kind of give a little bit about what your upcoming project. Oh, okay. Well, the next project that we're develop actually we're developing two projects. Uh. There are actually three, but actually the two the, the two documentaries that we're developing, we're developing a documentary about um, the bankruptcy. Okay. The bankruptcy. And we want to look at um, kind of the bankruptcy in two, in two areas. I'm kind of intrigued about the high finance and all those kind of things that went on, but I'm also interested in those people that were faced with losing half their pensions. Gotcha. So I'm kind of looking at, at from kind of like uh, as, a, uh, as a, I need to find a more articulate way of saying it, the high and low parts of the doc, you know, it's like the grassroots and the high finance. So it's uh, c- currently the working title is called How We Save Detroit. Okay. Pensions and Picassos is uh, that project that I'm developing. Um, also, I'm developing an, a project about uh, gentrification. Okay. And that's tentatively called When They Come Back. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, 
Mr. Harper, I, I really appreciate you getting the chance to come and come on the show. I definitely want to thank Sharon Dumas for allowing me to guest host. I tell you, the, today. the time has flown by. Well, it's almost like, you know, it just seems like it's what we've only been talking about maybe, what, five right. or ten minutes. Exactly, exactly. But that's what happens when you go and yeah. you get in a friendly environment like yeah. this and you right. start talking about something that you feel so comfortable yes. about talking about. But I definitely wish you the best of success. I hope that this documentary is given an opportunity to be seen by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I pray that, you know, all of the future endeavors that you have meet with the same type of success that this endeavor oh. will have well, as well. thank you so much. I appreciate you saying that. But... You've been watching Expose Under the Sun, brought to you by the Detroit Native Sun newspaper. I am your guest, Darwin Griffin. And if you would like to be a guest on the show or you'd like to advertise in the Detroit Native Sun newspaper that can now be picked up at Kroger's supermarkets, you can contact Valerie Lockhart at area code 313-457-5344. And again, I want to thank filmmaker, Emmy Award filmmaker, Bruce Harper, for coming on the show today. Got two of them. And we look forward to you joining us next week, same time, same place. Thank you for tuning in today. Thank you. Kinda hard to get a job back out on the block. Charge that to the game. Young girl, she grew up in a rush. Had it bad, no doubt. She don't know who to trust. Every man she ever loved only wanna crush. Charge that to the game. But it's all.